Okay, so I need to check again here. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Willem. Last I looked a while ago, there were 52 questions. 52, so, wow. Thank you for that, but also we won't touch a fraction of that. <laughs> Uh, but, hey, this is why we have an online bookstore. So, again, those, we, there's only eight or nine books up there, so check those out. And uh, if you want to go deep, there's deeper ones. You can chase some, some footnotes. There will be a lot of questions that those books will answer that we just we simply won't have the time for this afternoon. So, again, they were able to vote on these, and the top one uh, from, from oh, the get-go. Oh, they're actually voting on them. They okay, can vote on questions, yeah. So, this is really high-tech here. Really there you good. go, man. <laughs> So Eric asked and had 31 thumbs ups on this you question. You sure this wasn't artificial intelligence doing this, right? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. We'll see. Okay. Um, John 7, 53 to 8, 11, the woman yeah. caught in adultery. It's not in the early manuscripts we have available. Where did this passage come from? How do we treat this text? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's crucial. So it's really a, a crucial text, critical issue, right? And, and what I was saying is, is inspiration pertains to that which is originally given, and of course, then we tie inerrancy to that as well. So we have to, it's not like we're trying to eliminate any text, but we're trying to say, what did John originally give, right? And we'll only know that on the basis of looking at the manuscript evidence and data, right? So uh, the best manuscript seed, so this is an area of text criticism, uh, the best manuscripts seem to say that it wasn't there originally, right? So if that's the case, it's not that we're trying to eliminate Scripture, we're trying to be faithful. So if it's an addition, then that would be part of something. It still may be true. Uh, there's all kinds of things of John that said um, uh, many more things that Jesus did that aren't even recorded in this book, right? So it could very well be true, but if it's not part of the original text, then we could not say that it uh, bears the same kind of authority and binding upon us, right? So there's other things outside of the text in terms of stories and so on that may be helpful and so on. But I do think that because the best textual data says it's not part of the original, then I would be careful in saying it's part of John's gospel that was originally given, right? So what do you do with it in terms of preaching? To you? I think you have to teach people about how we got the Bible, right? How it first comes in terms of inspiration, uh, then how it gets copied, issue of text criticism. That only happens in John 7 to 8. At the end of Mark's gospel, there's some question there of what was original versus not. And obviously in, in 1 John 5, the old uh, coming out of the Reformation period, Erasmus and so on, the received text had a more Trinitarian statement that doesn't seem to be there originally. Or even with the Lord's Prayer, uh, for unto the kingdom glory forever and ever is... Is that, that's, you know, was that added type of thing? There's only a couple of places. All of those things are all true, probably. Uh, but with John 8, I would, I would be hesitant to say, if we're not convinced as part of the original, you have to teach, teach people of how we get Scripture. We're not eliminating anything. It's because of our commitment to the authority of Scripture. It's because of our commitment to inspiration that it pertains to that which is originally given, that that's why we're concerned about this. So it's not a sort of liberal tendency. It's an actual conviction that we have to know what's originally given and we're not adding to or subtracting to. So that's how I would handle that, yeah. That's good. In that, you hit on another question that came up in, in various forms. It's basically, uh, so the question specifically, how do the men who compiled the New Testament know which were God-breathed? So if you want to take this opportunity to sort of speak on canon, we didn't have time to address yeah. canon in the conference on the process by which they recognized yeah, what yeah, was. Yeah. So the canon issue, uh, if you're here Tomorrow we'll do that in the morning. If you're not, well, then you're not. But um, so, 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 so the issue here, Buchanan is a crucial, crucial matter, right? And so we have to first, there's, there's a whole debate that Protestants have with Roman Catholics and then even Eastern Orthodox, right? And which comes first, right? Uh, I think we have to say on the basis of Scripture that it's God takes the initiative, God speaks his word, he is the one who has all authority, he is self-attesting, and his Scripture then bears witness to him, right? So it has authority because it is the word of God. It is then recognized by us as that, right? So God's people led by the spirit of God recognize the scripture, right? That happened in the Old Testament era. You can go back and look at how that happened historically. But we know by the time of the coming of Christ, the coming of the New Testament era, the Old Testament scripture that was recognized to be authoritative scripture was already in place. The Jewish people knew about uh, what we call 
apocrypha or intertestamental books and so on, and they did not treat those as scripture. They made it very clear these books are the inspired word of God, right? So the Old Testament is a bit clear that because the New Testament then confirms that. Jesus speaks about the Old Testament, the New Testament apostles. In the New Testament, you don't have a later revelation confirming the New Testament, right? Because it's it. So what we have in the New Testament is coming from right, God's work in redemptive history, always tied to his covenant relations, he gives us a word. Right? And the same thing is there in terms of the new covenant. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, the closing of the revelation in Christ brings already the expectation that uh, there's going to be New Testament documents that bring the revelation of Christ to the people of God, to the church, and so on. And in the New Testament, we already see the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2, speaking of his writings as the Word of God. 2 Peter chapter 3 refers to Paul's writings. It doesn't tell you which ones he's referring to. That would have been great if he had listed them for us. Uh, but Peter then says, Paul writes these things, and, and uh, he says, uh, they're, they're, and he identifies them as Scripture. So he's recognizing Paul's writings as Scripture. Uh, the Apostle Paul quotes in uh, 1 Timothy, he quotes Luke's gospel in relation to Deuteronomy, and he calls them both scripture, right? So the New Testament authors are seeing that their writings, because they're apostles, uh, chosen by Christ, uh, the promise of the Spirit, that they are writing the New Covenant Constitution, right? They are writing the New Testament documents about Christ, right? And that is how then the church then historically recognizes that apostolic word. For the most part, the New Testament is apostolic. Not every book. But for the most part, that was a major, major criteria to be able to say, is this God's word? Did it come from the apostolic community? Most of the books, not all, do. And that was how the church came to recognize. But there's a lot there in terms of precedent from the old, the giving of the apostles. And it's very crucial in the New Testament, the apostles are, are called by Christ and they're unique, right? They're a, a unique era of the apostles. Uh, think of Acts 2, 42, where the church is following on the day of Pentecost the apostolic teaching, right? The apostolic teaching, Christ himself in John 15, 14 through 16 says, the spirit will come, he will lead you into truth after I depart. All preparation to lay down the New Testament, which is, we're already seeing the New Testament authors seeing that that's exactly what they're doing. And for those who want to dig deeper, what may be one resource on canon? Canon, the best issues on canon, there's a number of things, but particularly uh, New Testament canon is Michael Kruger. Michael Kruger that teaches at Reformed Theological Seminary in, uh, in Charlotte, I think it is. He's got a number of books on New Testament canon, excellent, it's the most up-to-date. Uh, then there's Roger Beckwith, uh, but I would look at Kruger for New Testament canon, and he discusses it well. Great. All right. What about other texts that also claim divine inspiration? Example, Book of Mormon. How do we know they are not Scripture right. since they claim right, to be? Right, right, right. Yeah, a crucial issue, right? Um, so when we look at, so part of the argument that I would make for the Christian uh, claim for Scripture is its own testimony regarding itself, right? We start with, because it is God's Word, God bears witness to Himself. There's no higher authority than God Himself, right? So then we run into the question then of, well, what about other religious texts that make that same kind of claim? What do we do? Are we just at a standoff, right? I'll pick my text, you pick your text, and we just go our own way. And the answer is no. First we have to acknowledge, first we have to say is that most religious viewpoints out there do not have anything that's similar to Scripture, right? Now what do I mean by that is, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, and so on, the very um, viewpoint that they have does not have an authoritative God, a creator God, an omniscient God, one who could even be the source and standard of truth. They don't, most of them are atheistic or some kind of pantheistic blending of the world together and so on. So most of the Bhagavad Gita's and so on is not the same claim as scripture. They don't claim to come from uh, the triune God who is eternal, who plans and knows all things. So the claim isn't even the same, right? So most religious claims are nothing to do with Christianity's claim of what the Bible is, right? So we have some that come from, script, from the Bible though, from Christianity that then try to copy the claim. And that's where we have Islam comes in, 
Islam is a post-Christian phenomena, right? You wouldn't have Islam without Muhammad appealing to the Old New Testament, right? Uh, his whole religion is we're the, he's the last of the prophets of that. And Mormonism is similar to Islam. It's quite different in terms of its content, but it also claims it's the, it's the book of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right? So it builds off of the previous revelation. In that very claim to have the same kind of claim of authority as the Bible, it renders itself uh, incoherent and uh, ultimately shoots itself in the foot. Why? Because in the end, uh, the Islamic claim to be Muhammad is the last of the prophets, the fulfillment of all the previous prophets, you go back to the prophets, and even in the Quran, he says, go back to the prophets. You go back to the prophets, and there's total contradiction. That's not the problem with the Bible, it's the problem with Muhammad. He gets the Bible wrong, and he gets the claims wrong. He he makes a claim, the Quran makes a claim, but it's a self-refuting claim. And the same is true of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon gives lip service to the Bible, but at every point it contradicts it, right? So at that point, the claim cannot make good on itself. The Christian claim can, right? When the New Testament author said, uh, Christ is the fulfillment of the old, and they put the New Testament with the old, they are arguing that it's consistent with the old. They didn't surrender the old. They put it together, right? And it made good on that claim. So that's how you'd go about arguing apologetically that the Christian claim of the scriptures is unique, right? It's unique. And there are others who try to copy it, but they're self-refuting. Does that make sense? I mean, so that's, yeah. yeah. It's helpful. Several people are interested in a specific verse. How do we interpret Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 where he, he distinguishes himself from Jesus? Yep. To the rest I say, not yep. the Lord. Yep. 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 How do we handle that in terms yep. of doctrine of Scripture? Yeah, a very, very important question. People have misused that greatly to say Paul's saying he has a different authority than Jesus has and so on. I think the best way to read 1 Corinthians 7 is just very clearly as what it lays out here is he's dealing with the issues of uh, singleness, he's dealing with the issue of human sexuality and marriage and, and singleness and so on. And all that he's saying is the Lord didn't say type of thing is that in Jesus' life and ministry, he didn't address the specific issues that Paul's addressing, right? So you go to the Gospels, Jesus addressed divorce, right? So he, Matthew 19 and other places, have you not read? He answers the issues of divorce, remarriage, and so on. You have the exception clause. I mean, he deals with that issue. He does not deal with the issue anywhere we have in the Gospels of singleness and the issues that Paul's dealing with in 1 Corinthians 7. So when Paul says, the Lord said this but didn't say this, He's just simply recounting in his life and ministry, he didn't teach on that. When he says, I say to you, he's saying that I as an apostle speak with authority on this matter so that I'm addressing something that the Lord didn't specifically address, but he writes as an apostle under the authority of Christ so that his word on that is authoritative, not because he's inherently so, but he's writing as an apostle addressing that issue. So it's not pitting Christ's authority against his, it's simply... The Lord Jesus in his life and ministry did not address this issue. I now address this issue and I address it as an apostle that you are to hear my word and obey it. If some versions of the Bible are better than others, are they all equally inspired and inerrant? And with that, there were a couple other questions about just your your preference, and you could speak to translation in general. Well, we're dealing with translation issues, right? So the principle we laid out in terms of the inerrancy discussion of original autographs, right? So scripture acknowledges copies. It acknowledges translations. The Septuagint is a translation. Ezra is translating as he reads the text, right? So that's parallel to our kind of translations. They're not illegitimate. In fact, it's, it's very good that we have translations so that we can read the Word of God to pass the Scripture into different languages. That was part of really uh, what the church has always done, but uniquely in the Protestant Reformation, to get the hands of Scripture in the Bible into the hands of the people, in the vernacular, in their languages, and so on, right? But the same principle applies. Translations are legitimate. Copies are legitimate if they're consistent with the original, right? So that that's the, that's the gauge, right? So that when we hold a copy, right? These come from copies, right? We are convinced that those copies that we have in terms of the manuscript tradition goes back pretty close to the original, right? So, you know, people make estimations. They'll say the New Testament is, you know, 98 
uh, percent of what the original is. And when they say, well, what happened to the 2%? I mean, those are just in terms of we're not sure about that tense of the verb or we're not sure about that sentence there or something like that. It's nothing in terms of doctrine changing and so on. So we do have, for all intents and purposes, practical purposes, the original in the sense of the copies that are passing on the message that we still have. Translations then, so the copies are evaluated in terms of the original. We pretty much have that. Uh, and the translations then are evaluated in terms of their faithfulness to the original Hebrew and then a little bit of Aramaic and the original Greek, right? Most of our translations, I would say, are very good, right? So I don't think we have to worry about this translation is far, far better than others. So we avoid paraphrases, right? Paraphrases automatically are, are removing yourself from the original. Every translation obviously has challenges. That's why we learn the, you know, in, in seminary Greek and Hebrew and teach that. So we have to have scholarship in the church that always takes people back to that, right? Yet I would say most of our English translations, ESV, uh, NASB, uh, CSB, uh, NIV, I mean, all of them basically render things, but we still have to always, even in that English translation, we can have confidence that this is the Word of God, yet if there's some precision, it always has to be taken back to the original Greek and Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, speaking of local universities, uh, one of them, probably more than one, teach the JEPD view of source criticism. Right. Can you explain the dangers of this view and the importance of affirming the traditional authors? You might want to explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The theory. Yeah, so JEDP uh, comes out of uh, an era of biblical criticism, so that arises in the history of the church. I mean, there's always been critics, but within the, within the church, there was never biblical criticism, whether it was in the early church, the Middle Ages, the Reformation, and so on. There was always the receiving of Scripture as authoritative, God's word. There was the debate over the role of tradition and so on. But in the Enlightenment, so the Enlightenment is an era that runs end of the 1500s, so say 1600, 1800, and then morphs into what we call the modern world. I mean, there was a whole shift away from biblical authority, human reason, and so on, and then coming to scripture and putting it under critical technique. So we have to look at historical criticism and the assumptions of it at the heart of historical criticism is ultimately a denial of the scripture from the out outset, right? It denies that it's possible that God can speak in an authoritative way. It denies that the miraculous is even possible and so on. That was at the heart of historical criticism. So as they come to then the, the various books, the Pentateuch, the first five books came under criticism. The Gospels came under criticism. The Pentateuch was divided into sources, right? So eventually the Pentateuch as we know it was very late in production, not given to us by Moses. Moses is not the author of it. It comes through various sources and these sources were tied to J, the name of Yahweh, E to the name of Elohim, D to Deuteronomic history. So the end of Deuteronomy, they made very, very late. And the reason they did so is because Moses is predicting the entire future of Israel. Right? And they say, well, you can't do that because he wouldn't know that. Well, of course, they're already assuming that he can't speak under revelation and inspiration, right? And then you have priestly sources. So they divided up the documents into all these sources and then they were compiled late. So Moses is not the author and so on, right? The problem with this is, uh, it's built on assumptions that have to be totally rejected. They're assuming an entire worldview structure that is already antithetical to Christianity. It has to be defended on its own terms. The other issue is, is that uh, the Bible itself speaks of Moses the author. Jesus speaks of that. Later authors uh, in the Old Testament speak of that, so they have to deny ultimately the authority of Christ. So we have all of that that has to deal with. And as you actually look at these, these uh, dividing into sources, there's a lot of rejection of this entire thesis uh, today, even by uh, non-evangelicals. They'll say, look, the Pentateuch is much more of a unified revelation. You have people in Old Testament studies, Reverend Childs and so on, and says, look, I can't separate these sources and so on. And, and the way that they separated the sources was, you know, in terms of Genesis 1 is the name of Elohim, Genesis 2 is the name of Yahweh Elohim, Jehovah Elohim, and they're saying, well, that's two different sources. No, uh, the reason why the name Yahweh is found in Genesis 2 is because it's the covenant name of God, uh, and it's related to Adam and so on, right? So their, their explanations were totally arbitrary, 
And even in today, much of that, even in the academic world, has been rejected. Uh, the, the Pentateuch is seen as much more unified. Isaiah is seen as much more unified. So you have to go after the critical assumptions. You have to then argue against its arbitrary nature. You have to then say, well, what did later scripture say about this? And so it's a whole argument. It's a whole, it's a whole uh, worldview argument against scripture. Several questions in relation to confessions and creeds, just for some context here in Abilene, both with Church of Christ, but probably with most Baptists in this city, pretty anti-creedal, anti-confessional, no creed but Christ. So talk a little bit more about confessions, and there's a specific question about should we, should we regularly recite, memorize the Nicene Creed? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, uh, confessions are tied to uh, the history of the church, dealing with uh, theological controversies and saying this is what scripture teaches, right? So the job of the church and ultimately theology is to correctly expound the faith, to teach people the gospel, to teach people who God is, especially in light of, of um, you know, questions that people have from within the church and also defend the gospel in terms of critics outside the church and so on, right? So that as you have in the history of thought, right, so the Arians come along, the Jehovah's Witnesses of the day, and uh, they then say, well, the Bible does not teach that God is a triune God, that the deity of Christ, uh, the deity of the Holy Spirit. Well, Scripture does teach that. So as the church put all of that together, says, who is then the God of the Bible? He's the one true God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. We get the Nicene Creed. That Nicene Creed, right, has to be evaluated in light of Scripture itself, right? I do think that early creed is reflective of the teaching of Scripture, right? Uh, that's why it stands the test of time. We don't have to reinvent the doctrine of the Trinity. They got Scripture right in terms of its overall teaching. The same would be true of later on with the person of Christ and the incarnation, the Chalcedonian creed and definition. That's not true of all confessions. The, still the same test is, is that confessions and creeds are very, very important because they reflect the church defending the faith, expounding the faith. If those confessions and creeds are true to Scripture, there's no sense in reinventing them again, right? They, they got it right, right? And so then they serve as a kind of secondary authority. Uh, if they do not get it right, then they are criticized by Scripture. So later on, we have the Council of Trent, uh, in the 1500s, they make many statements there about justification, salvation that are inconsistent with Scripture. So we have to reject that. So it's always the standard of Scripture, but where creeds and confessions get Scripture right, they are helpful. They give us guidance. They give us direction and so on. There's no sense in just going back and starting over again. There is within the church, God has given us his people so that we come from a whole stream of people, but we still have the priority of Scripture. So when you have the Church of Christ or the old Campbellites that said, oh, no, no, just the Bible alone, what often happens then is they end up in heresy. Right? They end up reinventing the wheel. They end up denying uh, the truths that the church has looked at carefully through the ages. And the same is with other groups like this. Usually those who want to say nothing of tradition generally end themselves in problems. Right? So always, even in our Baptist heritage, Reformation heritage, we've always held to tradition under Scripture Yet, as tradition and confessions give us a correct teaching of Scripture, they're valuable, they're instructive. We learn. We learn from the history of the church. We're part of the one people of God. Uh, that doesn't mean, then, that everyone got it right in every point. That's why Scripture has final authority. Right. Just double-clicking on that for another relevant question. Um, why is it important for Christian institutions to have a confession of faith? Yeah. It's important to Christian institution of confession of faith because it uh, gives, you know, we, it's giving them, this institution will stay within these confines and you know exactly what they're going to teach and be faithful to that, right? And the confession of faith, our confessions of faith should reflect what we believe that Scripture teaches, right? If we think that our confession is not true of Scripture, we need to modify it, right? Because we're always taking it back to Scripture. But institutions with a confessional heritage, you at least say this is where they're coming from. They can't just be in the eye of the beholder. They can't just interpret Scripture any way they want, right? Uh, and so it keeps them on tack. It's not enough, though, just to have a confession, 
So we've got confessions uh, in our seminaries and so on. People have to actually believe the confession. They actually have to put it into practice. They have to actually... So we've had this. I mean, Southern Seminary had a confessional statement of the abstract of principles. And until Dr. Moeller came, there was all kinds of people that signed it and didn't believe a word of it. Right? So there's where there has to also be the implementation of it, holding people accountable to it. What do you actually not only say what you obey, but put it into practice? That is for, uh, you know, help, help with our institutions. It holds people accountable. People drift. And you have to be, keep the drift from happening. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a triple click. Uh, why is it the case that, generally speaking, those who tout no creed but Christ tend to be theologically liberal? Well, because they, they are... They often will be, they will succumb to the pressures of the day, right? So the danger is, is that we say no creed but Christ, but then we just mix it in some kind of syncretism with the culture of the day, and they eventually end up liberal, right? So they're not being, they're not saying that there is a faith once delivered to the saints. This faith then is open to, yes, I'm going to say it's the Bible and no creed, uh, but it's really open to my interpretation and my perspective, right? So we had that even in our, our Southern Baptist Convention where we had soul competency. That was totally distorted in the sense that, well, it's just the individual believer, their soul competency before God. Yeah, well, you as an individual are still tied to the authority of Scripture and the history of the church, where the, where the history of the church got scripture correct, right? So usually they go liberal because there's a kind of individualistic notion that then acts independently of scripture, right? So it sounds good. So when you say, um, uh, you know, D.L. Moody was once said, you know, what, what creed do you follow? He says, creed, I don't know, I just, I just follow the Bible. Uh, that is a good motive, right? So you don't, you know, so this idea of being biblical in biblicism in the sense of taking all things back to scripture, this is not a bad motive. Scripture is our final authority, but it's a bit off and naive to think that uh, we are just Johnny-come-latelys in the history of the church, that so there's nothing that's been taught beforehand. Creeds and confessions help as they remain consistent with Scripture. Yeah. What about head coverings and other nuances like it within the Bible? How do we determine what we should do or explain why we don't do it when it's in the Bible? Yeah. Yeah, so now we're, we're dealing with, we have biblical authority uh, but we also have, all right, how does one properly interpret and apply, right? And so there's issues of application. And those are, those are crucial matters, right? The biblical authority means little unless we can actually get the text right and apply it correctly, right? So those two go hand in hand. We haven't dealt with all the interpretation issues, but those are just as foundational. Does the Bible give us a view of itself? Does it give us a correct way to read itself? How do we draw application and so on? So on these particular issues, there are points of, of uh, okay, how does that actually apply? Head coverings and so on is, is, is one of those, those issues where this is where um, sufficiency is in terms of the entire Bible and interpretation ultimately is in terms of the entire Bible, making sure we're putting all the pieces together, right? So Christians will vary on, on you know, the head covering issue. Uh, some will say that this is part of created order, right? Um, my argument would be the head coverings is probably tied to a particular expression in that period of time of a created order, right? So the created order speaks of equality of male and female, yet role difference, authority difference in that area. So it shows up itself in marriage and churches and so on. And that head covering is reflecting that um, difference, that role difference, authority difference. The question would be, is that then required universally tied to creation order or is that an expression of? So some will say it is tied to creation order. If that's the case, then it would continue today. Uh, I don't think that's what's going on here. We don't have through the scripture, so the whole scripture, this idea, we do have equality yet difference, complementarity, uh, male and female, but we don't have a kind of theology of head coverings that runs through all cultures, all places, all times. So that's one way of discerning something that is a cultural factor. There are cultural factors. Greet one another with a holy kiss, right? Is that demanded so that we all have to uh, be kissing one another as we greet? Uh, are we violating that with a handshake or something? No, I mean, what's, what's going on there is Scripture saying, love one another, greet one another. There may be different expressions 
uh, of that type of thing. So that's a crucial interpretation issue. Is it grounded in a universal normative situation, creation realities, uh, or is it something that is a cultural expression of a creation reality? So that particular issue of head covings really revolves around that. Yeah. Gosh, how should we think about Apocrypha and literature, and then also with that, how to talk with our Roman Catholic friends about yeah. canon? Yeah, so the Apocrypha literature, right, is, is um, depending on how many numbers the books, usually it's seen as about 15 books, uh, that is written uh, by the close of the Old Testament canon, so Malachi, so you think of 400 B.C. roughly or so to the time of Christ, right? So they're Jewish, intertestamental, sometimes it's called Second Temple Judaism, because the nation came back, rebuilt the temple, so it's the Second Temple. So it's intertestamental Judaism till the coming of Christ. You have a number of books, the Maccabees, first and second, third, fourth Maccabees, uh, first and second Esdras, you have uh, uh, the Wisdom of Solomon, and so on. These were books written in the Jewish community that were then used by Christians early on with the Septuagint, right? So it was as Greece took over um, things and then Rome came in and Greece was the official language so everything was translated from the, the Hebrew to the Septuagint, to the Greek translation and then obviously the New Testament's in Greek. And uh, early church packaged these with the Septuagint and so some then said, well, these were viewed as scripture and uh, thus authoritative. That became the official pronouncement of the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent. Now that's 1500s where it became the official pronouncement, right? So how do we think about these books? So the Roman Catholics include the Apocrypha, a number of those books, as authoritative scripture binding on the doctrine and life of the church, right? Eastern Orthodoxy accepts some of the Apocrypha usually as useful documents, even the Anglican Church and that, useful documents, but not necessarily equal to Scripture, right? So how do we think about the Apocrypha? First, as they're Jewish books, the Jewish community never received the Apocrypha of Scripture, right? So even in the New Testament, you've got some quotations of it in Jude, Second Peter, but they're never cited as Scripture. The Jewish community did not receive them as Scripture. In the early church, many of the church fathers, Jerome, Origen, and others did not receive it. Augustine did a little bit, um, and it then was seen as, um, uh, as you particularly went through, the Roman Catholics picked up on it uh, in order to justify some of their doctrine in terms of purgatory and other areas, uh, but the church then, for the most part, and the reformers made it very clear, the Jewish community did not receive them, many in the early church did not receive them, and there's no reason to see these as scripture. Then we have to look at the Apocrypha in terms of their own claims. Uh, their own teaching and so on. Is this consistent with the rest of Scripture? Uh, there's many mistakes in the Apocrypha. There's many uh, things that aren't consistent. They don't make the same kind of claims. So I think the church is on good grounds. The Protestant church is to say the Apocrypha along with the Jewish community is not Scripture. Uh, the books that we have of the Old Testament is and the 27 books of the New Testament are. How do I defend against liberal Christians who say that the literal accounts of Old Testament narratives, creation, Noah, flood, did not happen? Yeah. Well, obviously you have to, uh, there's a whole number of issues here. First, when we speak of the term literal, it has to be defined what we mean by literal, right? So literal sometimes can mean to certain people sort of literalistic, uh, and so on. So literal in the best sense, right? So we speak about a literal sense or a literal meaning or a literal reading. In the best sense of literal would be that which is according to the intention of the author. Right? That's the best way. So authors write literature uh, and they intend to communicate what they're doing in that literature. And so the intention of the author is, in terms of literal, directly tied to the kind of literature they write, right? So narratives are written to communicate a certain point. Uh, poetry is literal in the sense of it's written as poetry, 
right? Uh, do I read the book of Revelation literally? Well, I do if I mean it by the intention of the author. What's the intention of John? The intention of John is to read the book of Revelation as apocalyptic literature. It's full of symbolism and so on. That doesn't mean we turn that symbolism on its, you know, sort of literalistic and make it stand on its head, right? So metaphors and figurative language are intended by the authors. Parables are to be read as parables because the author intends for you to read it that way. So first of all, that's what literal means. So when we come to Genesis, then we have to say, what kind of literary form is Moses giving to us in terms of the creation narratives and so on? Well, it's narrative, right? It ties into all of the rest of Genesis, so it's tied, I would argue, to history. Right? Uh, it is also giving us, I would say, a theological account, right? It's set within the ancient Near East. It's a kind of polemic against other creation stories, but it's giving you something that's true. It has symbolism in it, but that symbolism actually is given in a narrative form, so it's reliable and true, but it's not an exhaustive account. It's giving us a true account and so on. So that's how we would have to approach that. And then as we come to the science issues, we have to say, well, what are they saying is not true about this, right? Well, they would say, well, the theories of ev uh, evolution have told us that uh, uh, everything came by an evolutionary framework. Well, that has to be evaluated on its own terms, right? Is evolution true? Did that happen? Uh, science has told us that there is no historic Adam, historic Eve. Well, uh, what, does, what is Moses conveying in that literature? I think he's conveying historic Adam and historic Eve. So we then have to evaluate the scientific claims as scientific claims and uh, do that kind of critique of it. So that's how we would have to get at looking at what the text is saying, what its actual claim is, uh, and then dealing with those who say, well, this can't be. But usually when they say it can't be, it's because they've already adopted a whole viewpoint that says this can't be true, and that's what's, that's what's that question. That's what has to be evaluated. So you can't just sort of say, well, what they're doing is they're really treating the science as more authoritative than text itself. A couple questions about spiritual gifts, which, by the way, if you weren't here last year, AbilenTheology.com, you can find last year's lectures, which were Tom Schreiner, uh, Dr. Wellam's colleague, and it was on spiritual gifts. So I would point you there for uh, four, four sessions and a Q&A on spiritual gifts. But the question is, related to canon, see, I lost it. They just keep coming in. <laughs> if scripture is sufficient and the canon is closed, does God still give visions, dreams, or the gift of tongues or prophecy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we'll let Tom answer that, right? So, uh, no, I, I mean, yeah, we have to look at, obviously, this is um, you know, a crucial issue that divides Christians in terms of charismatic ongoing gifts and, 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 and so on, right? So we then have to say, I think we have to, uh, you know, first have the discussion over, um, do we expect the extraordinary gifts. Obviously, God has gifted his church, and that continues through all ages, but the debate is over the extraordinary gifts continuing. And extraordinary gifts generally are, are healings, prophecies, uh, the role of a prophet, giving revelation. So it seems in the New Testament, as you have the apostles and prophets, so Ephesians 2.20, so the pillar and foundation of the church built on the apostles and the prophets, that seems to be New Testament prophets. Sometimes people try to make that Old Testament prophets, but the ordering of the words uh, doesn't fit. Or Grudem and others will try to say the apostles who are the prophets, but it seems to be apostles and prophets. So there are uh, prophets that are laying down the apostolic uh, word in the New Testament as the scripture is being written. So does that prophecy continue? Should we view New Testament prophets even parallel with Old Testament prophets. So those are the issues, right? So I would uh, side with what uh, Tom Schreiner probably gave you last week is that, or last year, is that the, the apostles are given authority, uh, they are given the spirit, they are the ones who lay down the truths of the gospel, the, the tradition, they're laying that down. There's unique manifestations of miracles in that apostolic era, right? Yet the role of the apostles ceases with them. The New Testament is then given to us, right? And that role of the apostles does not continue. So we don't have apostolic succession in that way. We have the closing of the canon. We have the New Testament, New Covenant Constitution that now gives us Christ, right? So then the issue is, do we expect uh, ongoing apostles and revelation? No, 
right? So prophecy then, even New Testament prophecy is, I don't think, equal with Old Testament prophets. The apostles are, but I don't think New Testament uh, prophets uh, necessarily is, and I don't think that continues. Uh, and you do have then the extraordinary gifts. God can heal people and so on, but it's not going to be the same kind of concentration, in my view, as you have in the New Testament era that's giving attestation to uh, what Christ has done, the apostolic era, and so on. Now, some will say those extraordinary gifts continue, so they would be continuationists, and there would be then an ongoing debate with them in terms of tongues and so on, yeah. That's a, a more recent question, but getting those quickly, and also, again, really important for our context here, and thinking particularly for our college students. So why can we disregard Paul's writing to churches about head coverings, et cetera, because of culture, but not disregard First Timothy talking about women not teaching? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's, yeah, and you don't want to be arbitrary. You don't want to say, oh, well, this we can dismiss and that we can't type of thing, right? So we're committed to, we want to know what God has given to us and how to rightly apply the scripture, right? So I would make the case in 1 Timothy 2, in terms of uh, Paul's argument here, is that in this case, he is grounding uh, his argument of male and female relations in the church, and then, of course, he's following uh, on the heels in terms of uh, offices, uh, overseer, which in Scripture, overseer, elder, pastor is the same office, right? We're a little confused about that in our Southern Baptist Convention, right? In Scripture, an overseer, an elder, and a pastor are the one office, right? And, uh, and the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2, as he's speaking about in the church, role of men, role of women, and so on, his argument here in 1 Timothy 2 is grounded in creation, order, and norm, right? So in the whole canon of Scripture, right? So our drawing application in Scripture, we do distinguish creation, fall, the plan of redemption that unfolds through the entire Bible, and obviously it's consummation when Christ returns, right? Creation order, uh, even though in the new heavens and new earth there'll be no giving in marriage, creation order establishes norms, grounds, right? So the dignity of human life, the sanctity of marriage, male-female distinctions, those are tied to creation, right? They get distorted in the fall, and in redemption, especially in the new covenant, they get recovered again. They get restored again and so on. But there is a creation order. And Paul's argument here in 1 Timothy 2 is tied to Adam being created first, Eve second, the complementary role that they have. And then he falls. Remember, we don't have chapter, verse breaks. That was all added later. He falls right on here as a trustworthy saying. If anyone wants to be uh, an overseer, right? And then he goes on to lay down the qualifications for that. So it's following seamlessly. And in that case, he's grounding male leadership, elder, overseer, pastor, um, uh, uh, over against women who can serve in a whole variety of ways, but not that way, uh, in creation order. So head coverings, if one could show that head coverings is tied to creation order and is the proper expression of male-female relations, then you would argue that there's a consistency here. My argument would be is that the head coverings uh, doesn't carry through the Bible and even the New Testament that kind of creation order sense, right? But that's where the debate would be. So if you could prove that it would be creation order, then you'd have head coverings. Um, but I don't think it's the same. So I don't think you can put these parallel with one another. Yeah. It's good. You can Google uh, an article by Ben Merkel. He's a prophet at Southeastern, uh, really dealing with these two passages. Whoever asked that question, you just Google Ben Merkel, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Timothy 2. Pretty short, helpful. But what would be important, though, to say is okay, so say head coverings is a cultural expression. We then have to wrestle with in our day uh, how do we best express in our culture a male-female difference, right? And that's really crucial because this unisex, and, and you can then just pick your gender, right, is totally contrary to the entire biblical teaching at that point. So we have to wrestle with, in our marriages, families, churches, our, our role in society, how do men convey themselves as men, women convey themselves as men, and communicate the similarity, equality, but difference, right? So that would be the application for us is how... So in certain cultures of the world, head coverings may still apply as, as a part of that expression. Uh, I don't think it carries the same weight in our culture. So then we'd have to say, what does? And that would be a legitimate question that we'd have to wrestle with. Yeah. It's helpful, relevant. Yeah. Yeah. 
How do we deal with people who say they saw God or the streets of gold when they were hospitalized? Is it even possible? 28 yeah. thumbs up for that. Yeah, 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 no. Well, we have all kinds, yeah, of stories of people who have died and near-death experiences and, and, and so on. I mean, with any of that, you have to say, uh, Paul was caught up into the third heaven and saw things. Now, of course, he's an apostle, and there's unique revelation here. So is it possible that someone has experienced that? It's very difficult to disprove it, isn't it? I mean, they're saying that this, is, this happened. Yet, how do we use Scripture to evaluate that claim? I don't think we'd have to say automatically that none of that's possible, right? But we would have to say, well, what did they see, right? What are they now claiming? What are they saying from that experience? And usually, I don't know of any, I mean, there may be some exceptions, but usually the people who start saying things now say things contrary totally to God's word. Right? So, oh, well, I saw light, and everyone was there, and Michael Jackson was there, you know, all, all these kind of things. And, and then you start saying, okay, uh, Scripture speaks of a reality of who God's people are and what Christian faith is and so on, right? So then you begin to say, uh, I, I highly doubt that experience is of God, that was legitimate, but I'm using Scripture to evaluate often the claims, right? So the same way with someone says, you know, Benny Hinn conference or something, you know, he's got gold teeth or something like that. Uh, well, first of all, you'd want to say, open your mouth and are there gold teeth here? I want to see your dental records. I want to see if this happened, right? Even if it happened, one would still have to evaluate it in, is this an act of God or is this ultimately of uh, the demonic, right? There is a reality of spiritual realities here that are false, right? Uh, the Bible speaks of that. We're not just naturalists here. We actually believe in a spiritual world, right? So I have to evaluate Scripture in terms of their claims, right? If someone comes to me and says, Jesus did not come in the flesh, 1 John 4, I say Antichrist, right? Uh, so I have Scripture as the guide and authority to evaluate the claims they make. Uh, Y'all can stop it. I don't care how many votes this thing gets. I got the mic. <laughs> this is an autocracy up here. Uh, maybe last one, so uh, 30 seconds, but... <laughs> So in our circles, well, it depends. College students, the circles are, are quite diverse. But one of my concerns and some of our, some of the churches that have, have put this thing together is concerned that you sort of mentioned lots of places that will affirm authority, inerrancy, all the things. But then the word isn't actually in the driver's seat, right. which gets back to sufficiency. Right. So maybe, right. maybe as we wrap up here, share with us some areas that Bible-believing churches, so we're talking right. that would affirm at least lip service to inerrancy, where sufficiency is not being practiced? Well, I mean, one of the issues we're, we're facing with is, I mean, just in terms of how we organize ourselves, right? I mean, in terms of church uh, government, offices, the application of that, I mean, that's a hot debate within the SBC, and I would say uh, we have to go back. Does Scripture give us... So Scripture's not going to give us everything in terms of church government, uh, yet it's giving us enough, right, so that we do have... I think it's almost impossible in, in Scripture not to have an elder-deacon contrast. Elder, overseer, pastor is one office. Uh, there's everywhere you see in the New Testament, there's plurality of elders. I mean, I, it's, just, it's just the way it is. And Paul says, plurality of elders. So that would then be, okay, do we take what Scripture says or do we hold to our tradition that doesn't have that, right? So we'd have to bring churches in line with the scripture, right? So that's one example. That's an example that we're seeing uh, in terms of definition of pastor and so on, right? And the other area would be, I mean, uh, we're having debates in our circles more on the complementarian and egalitarian issue. So that's going to be what does scripture say on this? And do we embrace what scripture says and live out this as good and right? Or do we balk at it and fight against it. And then, of course, you've got even those who would say, I believe in the authority of Scripture and I'm allowing for, um, uh, you know, option B or option A in terms of homosexual desire and all those kind of things where the revoice movement, I believe in the authority of Scripture, yet one can have legitimate desire and that's not necessarily sinful, but Scripture seems to speak to that issue of disordered desires and so on. So those are some of the practical areas that we're seeing the outworking, and then, and then eventually would be, you know, how we govern our lives, our marriages, and so on. So those are some areas. Yeah. Maybe for real last one this time. Speak a little more to uh, sufficiency when it comes to word ministry, word work, so, and specifically, what does this mean for how preaching should look and right. counseling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I think preaching should be the proclamation of God's word in all of its fullness, right? So that has to be expositional, right? So we don't just, again, you can have topics, but the topics even have to have that which is tied to the whole counsel of God, a proper reading and interpretation and application of Scripture, right? So that requires exposition. Now, we have to make sure that as we do that, we are also giving theological grounding and and teaching the people, right? So everything you see in the New Testament is not just giving them nice, nice, nice sermons type of thing, but from the Scripture, applying the Scripture, working through uh, Old Testament, New Testament, and, and so on, right? So that would be what our churches should be looking like. They have to be grounded in the Scripture. If they're not, what are they doing? What are they teaching the people? Uh, what is the service for? Service is for worship, edification, discipleship, so that we're able to be equipped to go out into the world. So it gets back even to the mission of the church. What does the Bible say about the mission of the church and so on? So with, with counseling issues, um, obviously we have to do so from, and, and, and the counseling issues will deal with specific issues. Scripture specifically addresses some of the problems we're dealing with. Scripture has to have direct bearing. It may not, uh, you may have a counseling issue that, um, it'll be a, a question that arises in terms of, you know, husbands and wives are having difficulty in terms of how to spend money on, or something. Scripture may not address everything about how you always spend your money and how your budget should look, but then you would still have to say, what does Scripture say about communication? What, you know, there's, there's biblical truths about uh, debt, you know, and all that. So we're always taking things back to Scripture. In the counseling areas, how much do you let, you know, modern psychology come in and so on? Um, you know, they could say something true, but it has to be evaluated ultimately in light of the framework of Scripture, right? So if uh, modern psychology is undermining the reality of, of the reality of sin and desires and so on, Scripture says no, Scripture addresses that issue. So it's always taking back, in particularly counseling areas, and then also the practice in the church, Scripture does direct the, directly speak to those issues. That's good. Uh, friends, isn't our God so kind to give us a self-revelation? Yeah. yeah. yeah so thank you, Dr. Yeah, Wellen. Yeah. Would you join me in thanking Dr. Wellen for yeah. your time? Yeah. And I also want to say thanks to uh, Becky Bowen and the hospitality team. Thank you guys for yeah. serving us. Um, and... Everyone else who ha- helped plan this, uh, particularly Cooper Osborne and Chase Shelton, thank you guys for a lot of the admin details. Uh, would you stand with me? And we'll close by hearing from Psalm 19.7, and then I'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's pray together. Father, we are very thankful that you are there and you're not silent. You haven't left us in the dark. You have revealed yourself through the word of God written and we're grateful for it. Thank you for this time. We've been able to reflect on this book together and I pray that this would bear fruit in our own lives, that we would have a higher view of you that would lead to a higher view of your word. Help us to cherish it. Would we long for it like infants long for milk? Your word is truth sanctify us by the truth. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen.